So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen, nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum everyone. Um, I am Al-Humad Al-Aziz, uh, fourth year currently. And I'll be giving you this session, um, a review about the buffers and pH regulation system. It was originally given by Dr. Abdul Jabbar Rasul. Uh, I'll try to just give you the main concept behind it because like it's a lot of chemistry, basic chemistry, and it's a lot of you know, basic math and basic chemistry. Um, so it's not, those are stuff that you generally don't need to know, but you need to know like, how does it affect you uh, in the biochemical sense and in the medical sense. Okay. So starting off, we need to know like the ba the basis of everything, which is why do we have this whole concept of buffers and such. So the human body, of course, it maintains, it has a, a pH balance. It needs to have a certain pH. It cannot go over it or under it. And if it goes over it or under it, it can genuinely get a lot of damage and it might lead to death. So the um, pH balance is usually around uh, 7.35 to 7.45. If you go over that, it's usually alkalosis. If you go under that, it's usually acidosis. We're talking mostly about like most of the fluids in the body, but like the fluids that we generally can easily measure are the, is the blood, right? So this is usually the pH of the blood. Different tissue will have different pH depending on like the timing, depending on a lot of things. But Sienna, in general, we're talking about the average is between the 7.35 to 7.45. And this is extremely important for the work of many enzymes and many proteins and many everything. Okay. Now, this pH is always subject to change because we're always having reactions happening in the cell and outside of the cell. Most of the reactions will happen in the cells, in the aque aqueous environments of the cells. And them being in an aqueous environment means that they are in a solution. They're happening in a solution. And any solution is liable to change in pH. pH like only has really a major effect when you are in a solution. So like the hydrogen concentration changes a lot in the solution, which is why any chemical reaction uh, can change in the pH of the cell. And if the pH is, uh, of the cell ca can change, it can expel or it can absorb hydrogen ions. And by expelling or absorbing hy hydrogen ions, it can send this acidity outside. So you will get the expert, you will get acidosis or alkalosis in the interstitial fluid and in the blood. But generally, what I'm trying to say is that the source of the acidity is inside of the cell, but the expression of the acidity happens in the blood and plasma and uh, interstitial fluid. I hope that makes sense. Okay, and this is just showing you just a general idea about how you can find most of the body parts, body stuff in the around the seven saliva is bit more uh, acidic, pancreatic juice is a bit more basic, etc. Now, here we start talking a lot about the basic chemistry of the idea, which is the pH and pKa. Now, I think everyone knows what pH is. pH is just a measure of the concentration of hydrogen ions in a solution, in an aqueous solution. Okay, so the more hydrogen ions you have, the lower your pH is. Okay, pKa is a more difficult concept to understand. It's the main thing that you need to keep in mind is that pKa is a constant. That means every single solute or every single compound, every single acid only has one pKa and one pKa only. And its pKa dictates how it reacts with other things. While the pH just depends on the concentration. So even if I have a very strong acid, but I dilute it a ton, it might have a low, uh, a higher technically a higher pH than a very weak acid that is very concentrated. Okay, so pH changes depending on the concentration. But no matter what my concentration is, my pKa stays constant. Every molecule or every acid has its own pKa. Now the pKa describes how the acid dissociation happens. And when does it dissociate into, because like every acid is hydrogen ion and the um, accompanying base or whatever it's called. So when do they separate? That's the question, right? And basically at what pH do they separate more? Do they separate more at higher pHs or lower pHs? That's how you can think about the pKa. The pKa 
is a very any a very important concept in chemistry but for us it's not that important except in a very specific application that we will be talking about much more uh, later okay so that's the first point that you need to know the difference between a pka and ph now here we start talking about like what do we need to have a buffer system okay now we were talking about just just now the whole idea about oh acids can dissociate right and you will get when you dissociate you will get a base and the um hydrogen ion right so this is our weak acid the acidic acid for example when it dissociates it dissociates into a weak base or a base and a hydrogen ion right now the idea is a buffer system works at by keeping the ph the same as it is okay that's the whole idea of what a buffer system is it tries to keep the ph the same no matter what happens now what does this in the, uh, what does this mean it means that what's a ph that's the first thing you need to keep in mind what is a ph the ph is the concentration of hydrogen ions correct so to stop the change in ph you need to stop this uh, the change in the concentration of hydrogen ions it's as simple as that and to do that you need to have a molecule that can either take up and you know, pick up the hydrogens that are excessive or can give hydrogen when you are in need of hydrogen okay and this is basically what the buffer system any buffer solution will do it will either be a buffer solution that can that will take the hydrogen the excessive hydrogen or will give hydrogen when we are in need of hydrogen just to keep the ph steady all right uh yeah so this is basically the idea behind what a buffer system is um, of course the acids are marked by ha while the bases the accompanying base of the acid is marked by a my negative because it lost the h plus and uh, it's combined basically uh, with the added h plus or oh negative which this one is responsible for the basic activity this one is responsible for the acidic activity and they neutralize them all right um yeah so the, the buffers work really well when you are near the um yeah the buffers work really well when you are near the pka of the buffer okay so at the pka of of anything it is that the molecule is very ready to give and take okay so it is literally in a state where it is ready to give hydrogen ions and it's ready to take hydrogen ions that's when you are near the pka all right so when you're near the pka you can the buffer can take up hydrogen eliminating any ph changes and it can give hydrogen eliminating any ph changes accordingly um yeah so and then he just uh, here they just give uh, an example of for example the dihydrogen phosphate hydrogen phosphate buffer system which we have in the cell inside of the cell the pka of it is around 6.86 so around this area which is yani which is pretty good for our purposes our purposes in the human body we want it to stay between yani, around 7.5 so this is pretty close to 7.5 right so around this period uh, around this level of ph it is very capable of stopping any change in the ph of the cell inside of the cell on the other hand, outside of the cell, we usually use the carbonic acid bicarbonate buffer system, which we will talk about a bit more later. Does anybody have any questions until now? If anybody has any questions, they can always either just unmute themselves. I think everybody can unmute themselves and they can type in the chat I, uh, anything. All right. Okay, good. So until now, we're now we start getting into a bit of well just getting the um information out of it or like getting the uh formula um now everyone took basic math i think but at the same time you really don't need much to understand this and you don't need to understand like how we got this um final formula but what we, you really just need to know is okay so this is the basic um, formula for the Ka. And then to change it into a pKa, 
uh, we usually take the, uh, logarith the logarithm of each one of them. So it was just changing the concentration of H. Over here, we changed the concentration of HH by giving it the log. And over here, we changed the concentration of Ka, or Ka, we turned it into PKA by getting the log out of it. But the idea is, that the thing that you really need to know is when you're looking at this, or you're looking at this, right? The thing is, with this, you can get a clear idea about what PKA really represents, okay? By this math equation. So if we put like the concentration of um, A and HA, so the base and the full acid, if we put them as equals, this will most likely like just remove this part of the equation, okay? Uh, yeah, I think that's how math works. I forgot a lot about math, but in, in general, that's how it works. So you will get that when, when do you have an exactly equal concentration of the base and the acid? You get that when the pKa is equals to the pH, right? So what does that mean to me? That means to me that when my molecule, when the, mo the pH of my buffer, all right, or the, PA the pH of my solute, all right, is equal, equals the pKa of my buffer, my buffer will be exactly half half concentration of the acid and the uh, of the acid here and the base here. This means that it has equal ability to take up hydrogen. The base will take up hydrogen or give hydrogen. The acid will give hydrogen ions. And this means that it is very capable of whenever there is any change in the pH, it can, if the change is, is in the acid side, it can take up all the extra hydrogen. And if the change in the base side, it can give away any lost hydrogen. Okay. So this is really just what you need to understand from this, uh, from this um, formula. The formula just tells you that when pKa equals pH, the ability, your, uh, the ability of your buffer will be very strong to both resist change in the basic side and in the acidic side. Does this make sense? Okay. Right. So I'll go to the next slide. Over here, it's a bit more of what I just said. Okay. So let's keep it here. If pH equals pKa, the base and the acid will be will equal each other. As you can see here, that's the acid and that's our base. They will e equal each other on this pH, right? And we're talking about acidic acid, I guess, here, or ethanoic acid. I think that's the same thing. Um, in case the pH is higher than the pKa, what does this mean? What does it mean for the pH to be higher than pKa? That means the solute is basic or acidic. Come on, guys. Just five minutes break to pray Maghrib. Uh, I, I, th I think I'll be done in like less than 15 minutes if you don't mind. Uh, you'll have a break before uh, the next one, that's for sure. Um, but I, I want to finish this. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, so pH, if it's higher than pKa, or, yeah, as you guys were saying, it will be basic. So we will be in a basic environment. That means that what does the solute need? Does it need you to give it more hydrogen or to take away hydrogen? You want to give it hydrogen. Yes. And that's exactly why in this state, our buffer will have less protono a protonated state because we're giving the protons away to minimize any change in the pH. And exactly the opposite if the pH is lower than pKa. If the pH is lower than pKa, what do you get? You'll have more protonated because our buffer is taking up any extra, um, you know, any extra hydrogens in the solute. And this is how our buffer is working. Uh, as you can see here, at this like levels right here, what is this between like uh, six and five? This or like four? This ethanoic acid is changing the pH very little. Like the pH is changing very little, even though the uh, concentration of whatever we're adding is very high. See, 
but after we like it just drops it just skyrockets as you can see here and down rockets i guess as you can see here so this is the idea you know and this stage in this range the buffer is working very very well at stopping everything from like you know changing the ph so now we're basically done with a concept of buffers um i'll be going on to how amino acids work as buffers okay now amino acids work as excellent buffers mainly because any okay so any area in the uh any i ion area in a molecule that can accept or give away hydrogen can work as a buffer. We agree on that, right? Because that's the idea of a buffer. It can either get an H or give an H. And amino acids, all amino acids have two areas that can give and take hydrogens. They have the amine basic group and the uh, carboxyl, I think, uh, acidic group, right? Carboxyl acid. Um, yeah, so each one of these groups can give hydrogen and can take hydrogen. And this means that each one of these groups work in a different PK, PKA, all right? So not both of them will be working at the same time. Each one of them has a different PKA depending because this one is a basic group in its natural state. So it will be working more in a different pH than, for example, the acidic group. All right. Now, so that's for all amino acids. They have two groups at least, as you can see here, the COOH and the NH2 or NH3, whatever. Um, on, on some amino acids, the acidic amino acids, like aspartate and glutamate, the acids, and the basic ones, arginine, histidine, and lysine, all of these have a third chain that can also work by getting or giving away hydrogens. So these ones will have three different PKAs, while other amino acids will have two different PKAs, all right? Now, the idea you want to look at, so looking at this, just to make, make sense out of what we're saying here, there is in the acidic environment, or right now over here, pH is very low, all right? There is a pKa, as you can see here, for glycine at 2.34. So it can work as a buffer at 2.34 pH. Good. In this state, what do you expect your uh, amino acid to be? Protonot protonated or less protonated? So HA or A minus, protonated, right? And as you can see here, it is very protonated. Uh, yeah, so the COOH is full with a, an, uh, an H and a proton, and the NH2 gained an extra proton. So as you can see here, it's working a lot, as you can see. Now, on the other hand, we have the other PK, which works in the basic side. The basic side, uh, just give me a second, I'll, I'll, I'll mention that. So uh, the basic side, as you can see here, is the one where you will be giving away your protons just to stop the change in the, um, you know, uh, the pH. So you will have a deprotonated A minus where the NH only has two uh, hydrogens and the carboxyl group only has no doesn't have any hydrogens. All right. Now for the PI, I believe it's a PI. It's the number. It's the isoelectric point. Isoelectric point means that this is the point where your um, thingy over here, as you can see, the amino acid will be positive from one side and negative from the other side. So it will be isoelectric. It will not have a charge. All, yani, the majority of your elect, uh, molecules will be uh, uncharged. Okay. Now there is this concept of what a Zwitter ion is. Uh, the Zwitter ion is basically, it's an ion that is not charged because, so it has a charge, an ion needs to have a charge, right? Either negative or positive. So this one has a negative and has a positive at the same time. So it is charged or it's, it has different charges, but they cancel out each other. And this is what we call a Zwitter ion. So it is an ion, but if you calculate in the end, is it like a plus one, minus one? What is it? It's zero. So that's the idea. That's why it's written here is Zwitter ion. But the um, electricity of it is zero, uh, like total. Okay. So yeah, the isoelectric point is where you'll find that the uh, all of your amino acids are you know, just in the middle, not protonated, not deprotonated. They're in the middle. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so... 
do you think okay so in the uh, just a small question that i might i have over here the pka2 over here in the basic side deprotonated is basic that's correct um so all amino acids have two buffering zones except the acidic and basic they have three right all amino acids will have two buffering zones and every acidic and basic one will have three at least it will have three yes so in this pka right here the one in the basic side this pka belongs to what the amine group or the carboxyl group what do you think also yusuf stop uh remove the direct messages you're sending me all everything in direct messages um so ramin is asking what does the isoelectric point show us it just it, it doesn't show us much it just shows us where is the point where the amino acids will be in the switter ion form that's it it doesn't really uh show us much in this guy so people are saying that the carboxylic group is the one that's working over here is that correct so you're saying in over here, the um, yeah, it's the amine group. The amine group is the one that's working here. You can see just from the graph over here. Here it donated its H, right? It donated its H here, but over here it has it. So the change from here to here, the only thing that changed is the amine group. Well, over here, the only thing that changed was the carboxyl group, okay? And again, the PK, if the P, yeah, the PKA follows the PH. So an acid, the carboxyl group is an acid, an acid will have a PKA lower than seven, and a base will have a PKA higher than seven because they follow the um, PH. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's for um, the this slide. Okay, now here again, it's talking about how it works as buffers. I think I explained how they work as buffers. They just either give away their H, or uh, as you can see here, or they take the H, or they give away their H. I think I explained this. And then here, the isoelectric point is the pH at which the charge on the molecule is zero. As we said here, zero. Okay. Um, and if they ever ask you about what an ampholyte is, every amino acid is an ampholyte because every amino acid has an acidic and a basic group. Okay. And of course here, this is the same thing as mentioned over here. If the pH is higher than the pKa, then it will be pH is higher than the P. Uh, oh, so no, here we're talking about the isoelectric point. So the pH is lower than the isoelectric point or the number of the isoelectric point, what will we get? We will get a positively charged because again, and if the pH is low, you will have a lot of hydrogen. So everything will take up hydrogen. So everything will become positively charged. If every, if the pK, pH is high, everything is basic. You will be um, losing hydrogen to the environment. And so you will be negatively, negatively charged. I think that makes sense. Doesn't need much more explanation than that. Now, when we're talking about peptides, because we kept saying, in, oh, the NH works as its own thing, and the C carboxyl group works as its own thing, and blah, 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 blah. But the thing is, in, when we're talking about peptides, this amine group and this uh, carboxyl group are stable. They do not uh, uh, interact with anything. They, they are stable. They do not lose their hydrogen. They not, do not gain more hydrogens. So the only, even if a, in a long peptide, the only um, ends that work as buffers are the N terminal and the C terminal. Nothing in the middle will work except the R groups, which contain either uh, if they are from acidic, like a glutamate or an aspartate, or a basic, like a lysine or histidine. Does this make sense? How peptides work as buffers? All right, now for the next point, which uh, it just mentions a bit about what kind of buffering systems do we have in the body. The main buffering systems we have in the body intracellularly are phosphates and proteins. We have a lot of proteins inside of the cell and we have a lot of phosphates inside of the cell, as you can see here. 
extracellularly, we have the um, CO2 uh, bicarbonate, or like the bicarbonate, yeah, uh, carbonic acid uh, system. So our, PC, uh, our CO2 and our phosphates work as our main buffers. For a histidine is also a very important buffer among the amino acids. So like histidine alone can work as a buffer because it's P, it's uh, pKa is around seven point one, I believe. So it works really well as a buffer. Okay. Now we'll talk about more of the application of buffers and such in the human body. And here we have the main application. Whenever we talk about like acid-based metabolic metabolic disorders, we're talking about breathing. So CO2, as we said, CO2 is a very important part of the buffer system. Okay. Why? Because CO2 through the reaction with water by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase can make this carbonic acid. All right. And the carbonic acid, as you can see, it can dissociate and give you hydrogen. And hydrogen will make everything more acidic. Okay. So to Keep it very briefly, more CO2, more acidity. Hypercapnia, increase of CO2 in the blood, will cause acidosis. This is very, very, you know, a rule that you should keep in mind unless there, is, there was something causing you know, a basic state beforehand, you won't get the, you know, the acidosis. But as long as you know, the problem is an increase in CO2, you will have acidosis. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So why did what does it happen again? Because CO two will bind with water, make this uh, weak acid. This weak acid dissociates, and you get the H plus. Simple. So as long as CO two keeps being expired in the lungs, because in the lungs you do the other way around. You you take this acid and you turn it into CO two and you expel it. So you decrease the acidity through ventilation, through breathing out, through expiration. You decrease acidity. And through metabolism, you increase acidity usually. Okay, so as long as you're breathing well, you will be regulating your acidity relatively well, unless you have other problems. Okay, now here we start talking about like, oh, what are the sources of hydrogen in the body? The sources of hydrogen in the body, or sort of acid acidity in the body, are many. You have so many sources of acid in your body. So they, the doctor goes over a few of them, like for example, the complete oxidation of carbohydrates and fats. All of this will uh, will produce like the complete oxidation of fats will give you, for example, ketone bodies, which are acids, ketone acids. Um, the oxidation of carbohydrates will give you f a lot of different types of acids. Even like when you're studying, you just started uh, studying glycolysis. If you notice, almost every single thing that comes out of glucose has an eight at the end, pyruvate, ketoglutarate, succinate, uh, oxaloacetate all of these are acids so and of course we can't forget lactic acid lacti uh, lactate so all of these are products of your metabolism in the body and all of these are acids um of course the oxidation of proteins gives you amino acids from the name they're, uh, they're mo mostly acidic uh but uh, any which can produce strong acids uh you have sulfur containing amino acids and the cationic amino acid they're Again, there's a lot of sources of hydrogen, of acids in the body from metabolism. That's what they're trying to say here. So you have a ton of hydrogen being produced in your body, and you need to always, always be regulating how much hydrogen you have. And the main method of regulation of how much hydrogen you have are basically two, breathing and urinating. Your kidney works a lot on your kidney on your acid-base balance. And your lungs work a lot on your acid base balance. So here it's just telling you the simple idea. You know, the body contains different buffers, a lot of buffers. Okay. But the thing that you really, really need to know is that buffers do not remove hydrogen. Me turning well, H plus and HCO3 into H2CO3, I did not remove the hydrogen from my body. I only hid it, right? I only hid it and sequestered it, basically, made it un not expressed. But this H2CO3 can turn back into an H+, can dissociate again and give you the acidity. So you don't, you cannot live just by having buffers. You need to have buffers to stop the acute change. And you need to have a way to keep removing all the accumulating hydrogen. And this is what this, basically, this uh, slide is telling you. 
So here you're having like a lot of the stuff that are changing your pH. Okay, so CO2, H, H plus, sulfates, whatever. All right. The acute change in the body or acute reaction of the body is using the chemical buffers. So the chemical buffers are stopping any change for the pH. The pH is not changing. It's not allowing the pH to change by this these chemical buffers. Next, just to make sure that these buffers do not like get oversaturated, the respiratory response occurs to remove the CO2. And the renal response also occurs to remove any extra H plus through urination. You'll have a full lecture in the renal block, I think two lectures that are called acid-base balance. And you will get a full lecture, I think, in the, cardio resp uh, the cardiovascular respiratory block talking about how yani, the how the changes in CO2 and H affect respiration. So you'll be taking a lot about them later. But yani, the general idea you just need to keep in mind is how chemical buffering works, how respiratory response, how the renal response, all of these, how yani, the acidity change cause changes in the body is there any questions about this idea all the defending against changes in h plus and how we get h plus and all of these the sources all of these things okay okay so i think now is the last topic okay so now this is an example of a buffer system so this buffer system, which is we mentioned, the phosphate buffer system is important for what? Intracellular or extracellular? In intracellular, yes. So the buffer, this buffer system is very important for the uh, intracellular acidity and stuff. And of course, the good buffers in our body usually have a, P, a pKa around pH 7. So that's good. For us here, the PK, the one of the PKAs uh, of this buffer system is at 7.2. It has another PKA, as you can see here. It can gain. It has so it can go from PO4 to H3PO4. So it can get three extra hydrogens. It has one PKA for the first hydrogen at 12.4, very basic for what we need. We have one at 2.15, very acidic for what we need, and we have one at 7.2, perfect for what we need. So most of the phosphate acids that you will find in the body, you will find them either as HPO4 or H2PO4. You will not find H3PO4 unless the person is like dying of acidity or dying of alkalosis. Basically, you won't find like it's just just PO4 alone, right? Okay. So here is telling you just you know this buffer system uh, maintains intracellular pH. Those are the phosphates HPO4 and H2PO4. Uh, and of course, the protein histidine system, because the histidine has a very good um, pKa compared to other amino acids. The other amino acids, most of them do not have very good pKa for the human body. Histidine has a very good one. Uh, the phosphate system buffer, as you can see, is mostly for intercellular fluid. At a physiologic pKa lies near the pH. So the pH is very good for our purposes. And the ACF, our main buffer system, is the bicarbonate carbonic acid system. I'm not sure what the pKa it was for this one, but it's a very good pKa as well. Um, here is just mentioning how different enzymes require different pH. So, for example, pepsin, which is an enzyme in the stomach, requires a very low pH. And this is why the stomach has to be acidic for the enzymes required to work. Trypsin, which is found in the duodenum, given by the uh, pancreas, the duodenum is mostly near on the basic side, uh, so close to the base, uh, basic side. So that's why trypsin works perfectly near the seven uh, side. Lysozyme works more in the acidic environment of the inside the cell, stuff like that. So it depends on where you are, what you need for the pH, and what buffers are you going to use just to make sure that everything is work in working order. I think this is the last slide, which is talking about the acute changes. Okay, so imagine you have hypoventilation, right? You are breathing very slowly. There are many reasons that can cause you to breathe very slowly. Hypoventilation, okay? Um, if you're breathing very slowly, that means you are stopping yourself from excreting CO2, okay? Now, if you're not excreting CO2, what's the problem here? You are not removing 
the possible acidity in the body, right? So if you're not removing the possible acidity in the body, you're causing acidosis to the body. So uh, acidosis occurs due to inability to excrete CO2. And this is the form we call respiratory acidosis. There are every acidosis in alkalosis has either respiratory or metabolic. Metabolic is because of different chemical reactions inside of the body that can come from anywhere. And respiratory is just simply breathing. We are good or bad breathing. So if you're breathing very little, acidosis will occur because your CO2 is high. Um, and it will form H2CO3, which will then dissociate. If you're breathing very much, this can happen in, uh, yeah, in infections and in different meningitis, stuff like that, or drug induced, of course or psychological changes, which happen to a lot of people. Hyperventilation due to uh, physiological changes is very common. So people will breathe a lot. This means that CO2 will keep dropping, keep dropping, and this will reduce the acidity in your blood. And this will lead to respiratory alkalosis. Okay? So you'll become al any basic, the, your blood will become basic, and this might cause you to usually, most people who hyperventilate, Afterwards, we'll, they'll just drop unconscious, usually, if they go on for a long time. So yeah, so this is basically, um, so hypoventilation happens because of narcotics, uh, diseases of the lungs, of course, so obstruction of the lungs can cause a hypoventilation or like decrease of excretion of the CO2. Hyperventilation will happen because of these causes, and each one of them will result in alkalosis or acidosis. Just make it make sense in your mind, and you don't need to memorize, oh, hypoventilation and acidosis. Just know... Increase CO2, that's acidosis. Decrease CO2, that's alkalosis. And that is the lecture. I didn't break any questions, uh, honestly. But if anybody has any questions, go ahead. You can ask. Uh, I think it's... All right. Any questions? You are all very welcome. I hope the next two sessions are good for you guys as well. I think two sessions are with uh, Ibrahim Berkhi. He's really good. Inshallah, you'll, you'll benefit from him. Um, if anybody has any questions um, in biochemistry, I know I'm in fourth year, but I always liked biochemistry and I still think that I have good knowledge of biochemistry. So if anybody ever has any questions about biochemistry, I think I can help. Especially since my rotation right now is very relaxed, very chillax. Um, I think if you ask the academic team, they can send you my number if you want to ask, or you can email me. It's both fine for me. And yeah, thank you all very much for coming and uh, stop sharing. Yeah. Hey. Assalamu alaikum.